Uh, welcome to the second Social Justice Speakers Forum, which is part of the Children's Holocaust Memorial Exhibition uh, that is currently on display on the ground floor of the National Library. So welcome all of you. Uh, our topic is challenging discrimination credit in Aotearoa and what it means to be an upstander. Our panelists are Louisa Wall, a member of Parliament for Manurewa, Andre Whitaker, who's chair of the uh, Pacific uh, in De Park, who's the executive director of the Arbitrators and Mediators Institute of New Zealand. The forum is I've asked each panelist to talk for roughly about seven to eight minutes about what they consider to be the key issues in this area and also some personal experiences of discrimination and prejudice. I've then got some questions that I'm going to ask the panelists. We'll have a, just a, a round robin and a really nice kind of good vigorous discussion debate and then I'm going to open up uh, the uh, forum if you can ask uh, questions of the panel. So that's uh, the forum uh, of this evening. Uh, we will finish about our panellists. Uh, Louisa has been a member of Parliament for Manuela since 2011. She's held a variety of roles across the public sector as a policy advisor, policy analyst and community advocate including the Children's Commission, the Families Commission, the Human Rights Commission, Auckland University of Technology and Counties Monaco DHB. Obviously she's also had a distinguished sporting career including being a member of the Silver Ferns and a member of the Black Ferns. She has a Master of Philosophy in Social Policy and a Bachelor's Degree in Social Policy and Social Work. And uh, she was the member that introduced the marriage equality legislation into the New Zealand Parliament back in 2013. A very, very significant landmark social justice is uh, the chair of the Pacific Community Leaders Forum. He's an experienced executive with a proven track record working in the non-profit sector. He has a postgraduate diploma in human resources management and services from Victoria University of Wellington. Currently he is director of the child rights team for UNICEF New Zealand. And Deb Hart is executive director of the Arbitrators and Mediators Institute of New Zealand and a member of the Human Rights Review Panel and a member of the Expert Reference Group of the Family Justice Review. Deborah has an LLB from Victoria University of Wellington and was admitted to the bar in 1985. And um, I'm just required to read some health and safety instructions. Um, in the event of an earthquake, please assume the braced position. Do not leave the building. Wait for National Library staff to give further instructions. If there is an evacuation, please exit out of the Aitken Street exit, which is the exit immediately to the right. Turn left. Stay on the left side of the road and assemble across Guthrie Lane. Male, female and disability bathrooms are located just to the right of um, the reception desk and unisex bathrooms are located to the left of the auditorium exit and through the glass doors. So I'd now uh, like to ask our panellists to uh, give their uh, views on what the issues are around this important topic and I'm going to ask, to, uh, ask Louisa to sort of kick us off. Kia ora mai nō tātou, uh, ngā mihi ngā mana whenua ngā tītua te atea, uh, tēnā tātou, uh, all of us who call Aotearoa New Zealand home, uh, if there are any visitors, uh, know my home mai, uh, we're very uh, welcoming here in Aotearoa New Zealand and it's wonderful that we've all taken the time tonight uh, to be here to discuss uh, what I think is a, is a very, very important kaupapa and so I want to acknowledge uh, the Holocaust Centre of New Zealand uh, and Diane uh, and the work that you do to ensure that uh, we never forget. We never forget uh, our history, we never forget the experiences of those who have uh, first-hand uh, experienced what it um, means and looks like uh, when another group of human beings try to exterminate you. Uh, and in fact, if I uh, think about uh, those survival stories and those of our refugee migrant communities and the whole uh, are you sympathous for forums like that um, when I think about discrimination and prejudice actually that was at the heart of the Holocaust uh, it was a group of people uh, who wanted to exterminate another group of people because they uh, thought that they were unworthy unworthy of life unworthy of culture unworthy of language and so um, I, I particularly wanted to draw that conclusion because, uh, you know, discrimination inherently uh, is about power. Discrimination inherently 
uh, in different societies. For our society, it means uh, that if you're an indigenous person, uh, a colonizing force, a white force has come in uh, and taken our lands, taken our ability uh, to live communally like we used to, to practice our culture, uh, to practice our language uh, in everything that we do. And so it's quite symbolic that we're here during Te Matatini. I'm not sure if many of you know, uh, but it's a cultural celebration for all of Māoridom, where 46 groups from around the country have been uh, practising, and I've got some whānau who are, uh, who are here for that particular kaupapa. And it really is a, a symbol of uh, our resilience and our uh, continued striving uh, within our own cultural context to be the experts, to be those who are passing our language and our culture on to the next generation. And so I want to acknowledge that. Uh, prejudice is also uh, that preconceived idea about value, about who's worthy, who's unworthy, uh, who should hold certain positions in society, whether it's based on uh, your race, your sex, your sexual orientation, your gender identity. Um, and I think uh, what uh, we all collectively work for, and I can say what is my uh, ethos as a Member of Parliament, uh, it is to be a human rights champion. Um, I was destined to be that, uh, and I blame my parents, because I'm one of those kids, uh, and I was told from my father, if I ever see something uh, or hear something that I disagree with, if I don't speak up, then actually I'm complicit. I'm actually supporting that behaviour. So from a very young age, um, uh, in, in our Māori communities, uh, sometimes it's called whakahihi, which means uh, you're a bit of a problem, you're a bit of a tr troubled person because you like to challenge. Uh, and I've always had that in me, to be whakahihi. Um, and, and being able to challenge and being able to speak up when you, when you see that because you have a, an ethos of what social justice means in practice, uh, is also why we're here today, because everybody needs to stand up. No matter where we are, when we see things that are happening in our society that are just fundamentally wrong. Uh, and I saw that last year. Uh, look at what happened to the Nelson Centre. And what did Wellington do? They responded by welcoming the Wellington Centre here and actually honouring and acknowledging that uh, Centre comes in many forms and we don't have to take Coca-Cola's form to mean that it's only white men. But actually, it's about uh, the different representations in our society about giving and loving and caring, and they can take many forms. So uh, our ability, I think, to translate uh, those symbols uh, into something that's meaning meaningful for each of our cultures, and can I say, coming from South Auckland, our Santa Claus is never white. <laughs> um, so when I when I've looked at the issues that we've faced, I mean I'm a st I like statistics. So I've looked at uh, the Human Rights Commission and uh, the complaints. So if we just look at the last year that I could get statistics for, there were 458 complaints, and 37 percent of those complaints <laughs> were related to racism, racism experienced by people uh, who uh, were managing their employment situations. They were being discriminated through government activity. And can I say that's the majority of the work that I do as an MP. My constituents come to me because they're not being treated fairly by Working Income New Zealand, by ACC, by the DHB, whatever it may be. And my job actually is to hold the system accountable and make sure that they're not discriminating against any citizen who has the right to access whatever services and resources we as a state provide. Uh, it was also in the provision of goods and services. And when I've looked at what some of that, those racist complaints were, they have been about exclusion. They have been about othering, naming people. They have been about people not being able to speak their heritage languages. Uh, so um, I'm uh, one for talking about these issues and highlighting them. And I do want to acknowledge that the Human Rights Commission uh, under um, Dame Susan Devoy, and, and hopefully that will continue, focused on a campaign which was um, about uh, giving nothing to racism. And I love that because that's about naming and sometimes shaming, but actually getting to a point where we can call people out, it can be constructive, but ultimately if we don't use our voices to challenge people at the time, 
when we see their behaviour is inappropriate, then you know that's a sad indictment of our society. And I think forums like this are about that, about um, when should we speak up, how should we speak up. And I've now become uh, really clear that sometimes you can speak up as an individual, uh, but most of the times you need to speak up as a collective because it's through that collective action, uh, that solidarity, that you can actually uh, make real change. Um, and, and in focusing on that, I just want to say the reason I arrived here right on six is that uh, we've just had a, a maiden speech by a woman called Agnes Sorheni, who is the first Pacific woman to represent the National Party, but she's also the 150th woman uh, to represent the New Zealand Parliament. And I've become incredibly passionate about uh, the legacy that uh, we all have within the institutions that we're part of, because last year was the 125th celebration of suffrage. This year, on the 29th of October, we will actually celebrate that. It's 100 years since women could stand for Parliament. And it was actually 40 years post getting the vote that we actually had our first woman parliamentarian. So it's an interesting... Uh, time and I'm all for uh, yeah celebrating and honouring um, at the moment. Um, when I think about me, and please give me a two minute warning, you know a couple of things that I've done recently, the marriage equality bill um, I did, I had the mandate within my party and for me it was all about inherent discrimination by the state um, against their citizens and I think that was the simple principle. And actually, at the end of the day, what we weren't trying to say to religious institutions was, uh, if it didn't fit your definition of marriage, we believe in freedom of religion. Although I think the UK are looking at a, an inquiry about whether or not freedom of religion actually contributes to the high rates of suicide. So I, well, I'll be watching that interest, you know, with much interest. But fundamentally, we said the state can't, but there are certain institutions like religion that can. Um, so we were never going to compel religious ministers, for example, to take part uh, in same-sex marriage ceremonies if that was inherently against uh, their beliefs. So in doing all of that, there's always a fine balance, right? Freedom from discrimination with freedom of religion. And I actually think we navigated it and walked that path pretty well. Uh, there was singing after our uh, enactment as opposed to what happened in other countries. Um, about, gosh, four years ago, I can't even remember, it just took so long, but there were some cartoons that Fairfax published uh, that was um, depicted by their chief cartoonist down this bit in the Christchurch Press and the Marlborough Express that I ended up uh, with my wife going all the way to the High Court uh, <clears throat> to challenge that notion of freedom of expression. Because uh, essentially what those cartoons did was to pick Māori and Pacific peoples as uh, dull bludging, smoking, uh, drinking, uh, uh, people who essentially uh, wanted the food in schools program and we were so consumed about getting this free food that they had depicted grandparents dressing up in school uniform so they could get this free food before they went to uh, the casino or gambling and a whole lot of other really negative stereotypes about uh, about our Māori and Pacific communities. And I chose to make a stand about that particular issue because in talking to the young people in my community, uh, they said that actually uh, it affected them. When they first saw it, they thought it was slightly hilarious and amusing, but when they looked at the deeper meaning behind it, it was exactly what we're talking about tonight, tonight. prejudice, discrimination, that continues to be uh, perpetuated by institutions like Fairfax, uh, and mine really was a challenge to Fairfax, not of the artist or the cartoonist, they have every right to draw whatever they like, but actually my challenge was to Fairfax and the process that they went through in the human rights assessment and, and whether they should have published it in the first place if it was going to uh, damage uh, and particularly young people's perceptions of themselves. Um, the other issue that I have become quite passionate about lately uh, is around trans identity and the changes that we're proposing to the Births, Deaths, Marriages, Relationship uh, Registration Act and the fact that within that legislation we're proposing that self-identification 
become the norm rather than a medical model which says to somebody there's something inherently wrong with you and so if you're a, a trans person you have to get a medical diagnosis you have to go through full gender reassignment surgery then you have to apply to the family court and then we can change uh, your gender or sex on your birth certificate so for a number of years now many countries have been debating the human rights implications of that and essentially said someone shouldn't have to be medicalized that actually people who say they are trans or all non-binary by the way uh, all want to put an x which means uh, they're just not male or female we are we are saying through a process that now is uh, in its third or fourth year because we had a petition uh, by a woman called Alison Hambler went through the select committee process there was you know community consultation and a whole lot of other uh, engagement. Um, the ministers accepted those recommendations, uh, but there's a group called Speak Up for Women uh, who are fundamentally saying they don't believe trans, uh, and this is only one way. We're talking about uh, men who say they may be uh, biologically, so their sex and gender may be male, but they their gender identity is as a female. Uh, the Speak Up for Women's group are, are essentially uh, refuting that they can never be women and saying that they will purposely go into women's context so that they can prey on them and rape them. And I fundamentally uh, disagree with that as a proposition. Uh, I think that actually, you know, if I really think about um, what they're saying, and for me it goes back to the 70s where uh, there used to be slogans in an Auckland museum last year as part of the suffrage celebrations. There were posters that said, used to say, some men are rapists, and then the radical feminists used to say, all men are rapists, because they have a tool, a penis, that can rape women. And it kind of reminded me of that radicalisation where uh, some feminists said you can uh, with men, and it reminded me of uh, some of the early 80s in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where if you were a Māori, you weren't allowed to have a Pākehā uh, partner because you were somehow, uh, oh, well, you're being disloyal to the cause. And so some of these notions that we're discussing today and next week on the 26th of February, I'm going to a Speak Up for Women event, uh, and I'm doing that because I fundamentally believe in the human rights of trans, non-binary, intersex, to self-determine. And the reason that I do so is that I'm incredibly passionate about our young people. And I, I believe that unless we, as a society, send these signals, then our young people think there's something wrong with them. And there's nothing wrong with them. They are perfect the way they are. It's just our system doesn't fully embrace, nurture and love them and support them to be who they are. Because the alternative is suicide, and that's the reality. So if you're a trans young person, you're five or six times more likely to self-harm and suicide. And I think that if we tolerate that in a modern society that has the access to knowledge uh, and the evidence about how important it is, then actually we're not standing up. We're just being passive and bystanders uh, and uh, colluding uh, with a system uh, that I believe has contributed to many, many, many suicides of our LGBT youth broadly, uh, but particularly uh, of our trans community. And I think it's intolerable in a modern uh, democratic society that we allow that to happen any longer. And that's probably a good place to end. Uh, so I look forward to answering questions. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to share this time and space uh, with all of you and I um, congratulate and thank you for coming along because these discussions are really important and it's wonderful to see so many young people in the audience today. Kia ora. Andre. Thank you. Tēnā koutou. Uh, greetings, I'm Andre Willeke, uh, Chair of the Wellington Pacific Leaders Forum, um, also Director of the Advocacy and Child Rights Team at University of New Zealand. Um, I'm the first generation child of um, migrant parents from the Pacific, 
dad from Tahiti and mum from Rarotonga. Uh, I'm number six of seven children. Um, got three kids, one of them is here today watching. That's great. Hello, Mariah. <laughs> um, and I have one Mokopuna. So um, that's a little bit of a family background. I'm also the chair of the Rainbow Rugby League Club in Mauha, if you remember out that way. <laughs> and I do Waka Ama at the Tunui Ataika um, Outwear and Canoe Club. So I come here wearing a number of hats and to bring to the square. Now, look, as Kiwis, we pride ourselves on the notion that we are a fair, progressive, egalitarian society. You know, first to give women the vote, um, momentum, and the acknowledgement that we're seeing now in the Treaty of Waitangi. And you know that old Kiwi thing, if you work hard, you can get what you want. Everyone has the same opportunity to succeed. And you can see Kiwi celebrate fairness, fair play, um, what fairness means um, through stories and rituals and nowhere better than we're us through our sports people as heroes and things like rugby, cricket and, um, and sailing. So, uh, you know, during the America's Cup in 1989, um, New Zealand came second to um, Dennis Connors and San Diego team and um, Michael Fay, who was a lawyer, challenged and said, well, that wasn't fair because they used a double hold catamaran instead of a monohold, which we did, and actually a catamaran, I'll come to that. It's the vessel that Polynesian people used to cross the ocean, but I'll come to that story later. Um, so it wasn't fair. They said, that, that's not fair. That's not plain fair. And um, the court ruled in favour of New Zealand, and we won that. Um, some of you may remember uh, Richard McCall getting accused of being a cheat. Um, because of the way that he got to the breakdown at the Wolves and Rugby, and, and, and Rugby, if you follow Rugby. And um, people were saying, well, how, how could that be? You know, um, he must be cheating, that's not fair. But actually, we um, looked the other, not so much looked the other way, we just said he's so good and so fit and so fast at what he does that it looks like he's cheating, but he's not cheating, he's the all black captain. How do you say that? How could he? Um, and then, obviously, you know, um, the underarm bowling incident, which happened decades and decades, they still hold that up as they cheated, not us. This is the sort of thing that happens why other people do. Other teams cheat. Other people aren't fair. Um, not us, not, um, not New Zealanders. So the idea that things are unfair in New Zealand, that discrimination, prejudice, In fact, it cuts deep to the core of New Zealand's sense of um, fairness and identity. So especially the notion that Pākehā benefit from and promote discrimination, prejudice and racism, albeit inadvertently or that it's invisible, you know, with the two fish bowl, and one of them says to the other goldfish, isn't the water warm? And the other one said, what water? You know, um, it's so much all around you that they, they, they don't notice, don't notice it, don't notice it. So Parkia are trying to grapple with the claim that they are part of the system that favours and offers advantage to them over others is the cause of deep outrage, um, deep anger, deep vilification towards the narrator of um, such claims. So such um, vilification comes from actually a shallow understanding of New Zealand's history, a shallow lens on fairness, and a shallow willingness to engage and a show of recognition of the daily privilege actually most Pākehā have enjoyed their lives. And it's a privilege that creates a condition that American author and academic uh, Robin D'Angelo calls white fragility um, in her book by the same name, which looks at race relations in the USA and um, the reaction that white Americans have when they burst forward with, when they um, are caught out on the advantage that they have over coloured people, over black people in, in America, the racism. So I'm here to talk about the impact of prejudice, discrimination and racism on Pacifica people and the challenges and issues they face in standing up. So uh, there are four issues. Number one, New Zealand actually has its own version of white fragility. Um, this is responsible for the how dare you response that will many Pakeha have to being called out on acts of discrimination, prejudice and racism. Um, the response to the outrage which shuts down the conversation and um, the dialogue doesn't continue, we don't go anywhere, people deny it. And because it doesn't happen to them, Pākehā are insulated from the impacts of prejudice, um, discrimination and racism. Um, you might feel a little bit uncomfortable in certain situations, but the impacts are usually superficial and short-lived. So, like the goldfish, they don't notice it. So firstly, there's, there's an outrageous response to it, and secondly, uh, 
the other issuers don't know. So what? What are you talking about? What? Um, what advantage? What racism? How, how does that happen? We're all, we're all the same. So a receptionist being called a dumb palangi by a frustrated uh, Pacifica mother for pronouncing her name incorrectly for the umpteenth time at a health centre isn't the same level of discomfort as a health system that produces disproportionate negative outcomes for Pacifica people. So we see this through Pacifica people who firstly have been turned off by visiting the doctors in the first place when um, they're made to feel unwelcome. They just don't turn up for the appointment. Um, and secondly, where the diagnosis from the medical professional might overlook um, and not consider cultural and home life context and what that what the impact may be on the remedy that they prescribe. prescribe. So um, another example is being the only Pākehā kid who feels brave enough to join the mainly Polynesian rugby league team at school. And all the other players are kind of every now and then speaking their own Pacifica language. And for the Pākehā kid, they might sort of feel like they're an outsider in that environment, that school playing rugby league, because there's you no know, rugby league's mainly a Pacific a Polynesian Māori sport in this country. And so you might feel like a little bit of an outsider <coughs> when that's happening at school, but it's not the same outsider feeling that Pacific kids, kids get from an education system that teaches kids about the conquest, the conquest of James Cook through the Pacific, his discovery of New Zealand, but fails to acknowledge the skill, expertise and knowledge of Tupaya, the Polynesian navigator who was, who was critical to um, Cook's um, voyage. A history lesson that doesn't validate the intelligence, skill and knowledge of Polynesians and entrenches the view of smart white men taming the poor, uneducated natives. A survey completed by the Office of the Children's Commissioner last year revealed that Pacifica students encountered direct racism towards them from their teachers. They treat us like we are dumb. They always say our names wrong. So you think about the discomfort that a um, mum feels at the doctors with constantly having their name mispronounced and feeling unwelcome. Imagine what that's like for kids at school where um, they're made to feel unwelcome. Do you think they turn up for school? Do you think they'll do well at school? Um, do you think they want to um, constantly engage with? Uh, the impacts of colonisation um, manifest itself in many different ways. They are invisible to those belonging to the coloniser group, but feel deeply by those who are colonised, Māori and Pacifica, New Zealand. Here's issue number three. For Pacifica people who value humility, saving, saving face and not wanting to offend, then standing up to undertones of um, prejudice, discrimination and racism, uh, that, are taught, that is um, directed towards them, and they know that when they do that, the Pākehā person that's um, doing it to them in the first place is going to be upset, is going to be outraged, is going to cause offence. It's difficult for them to do because they are normally the ones that want to um, show humility, even when they are the ones that you think we're wrong. So that, that's number three. In many situations, there's actually a power imbalance issue that um, may pose a threat to security in their job, the house they rent, or how the kids might be when calling out prejudice, discrimination, and racism. But call it out, we must. Issue number four it can be complex to call out. So, at a systems level where legislation change is required around policy to do with health and education, um, they're navigating the language of policy, parliament mobilising support, getting the data, getting the research, um, connecting with the right people, uh, finding the right pathway to say a select committee submission process that can make change. It's a really difficult process and um, you know you, you obviously need to understand how to navigate that, but navigate that pathway on Pacific people must in the same way that they navigated the greatest ocean on the Pacific and getting to New Zealand. Um, Pākehā will say and have said, we'll just stand up and voice and have your voice heard. Well, for people who learn from Pākehā school systems that your history doesn't matter, who learn from Pākehā people in authority that your home life and cultural context doesn't matter, who learn from the front desk person that your name doesn't matter. In most cases, uh, for Pacifica people, your name has a direct connection to a very important ancestor. Um, and if that, all those things don't matter and you bring it to the attention of the Pākehā person that's doing it. Um, 
then we know we're going to risk upsetting their fragility and the offence and outrage that they will have, which will in turn be turned upon us. But facing and shaking that fragility, Pacifica people must. The issue, the issue is for Pacifica and standing up differ depending on the context, and we may need to do it. We may need to do it in a way that um, offers and opens the opportunity for dialogue. We may need to frame it differently. We may need to talk about unconscious bias that most people hold. Um, it's a way that will open up the conversation uh, a lot, um, a lot freer and a lot easier. And Pacifica people know that in order to do that, it takes humility and it takes understanding, and that's something that we can do. So framing it a little bit differently um, by calling it unconscious bias might be a way to do it. But there are times where we've just got to stand up and call it out and be strong. And these require leadership, it takes faith, it takes support from your whānau, and it takes courage. Uh, but for Pacific people, it's the same kind of courage that got us to jump in a double hold canoe and um, never get your way across the Pacific. So um, that's my piece. Kia ora, Mikau Fukatha Thor. Thank you. Tēnei koutou, kitoa, shalom and hello. Um, I thought I would talk about the oldest hatred uh, that there is anti-Semitism because it's making a comeback. Um, it has manifested itself in pogroms, blood libel, segregation, and of course the Holocaust. And today, it's in the UK Labour Party, the Yellow Shirts of France, anti-Semitic chants at football matches in Italy, a synagogue slaying in the US, a visceral hatred of the Jewish state Israel, and denial of Jewish history. It exists here in New Zealand too, in cemeteries being desecrated, uh, Jewish places being dawed, Holocaust denial letterbox drops in Dunedin, uh, just last month neo-Nazis protesting here in Wellington, and it's online of course. It results in our having guards at every Jewish event, at the doors of each synagogue and at the Jewish day school here in New Zealand. I'm a first generation New Zealander, my mother Inga Wolf, I was born in Vienna, those of her family who fled survived the Holocaust, uh, those who did not perish. Uh, my father, um, his family left their home in Romania because of pogroms finally uh, coming here. I remember from my childhood feeling really different from other children, uh, but mostly I felt different as in special and defined. <laughs> Um, and it's a great accolade to my parents um, and my non-Jewish childhood friends, Lizzie White and Robin Maxwell and their, and their parents, that I felt positive about being different. But being Jewish was not without its difficulties. Uh, as a child, I loved to sing, um, but the school choir often sang Christian songs, and it was made clear to me uh, that I could mouth the words, um, I could sing or I could leave. I left. Uh, there was religious education at my state primary school. My best friend, who was Jewish, Nina and I, uh, and a boy whose parents were atheists, had to exit the classroom each week, uh, left to play outside in plain view of, the, of our classmates. At secondary school, prayers were at the start of each assembly. So when, um, so when they were over, we would have to enter in front of everyone. Uh, we were oddities and it was human. When I was about seven, there was a boy who used to taunt me, calling me a dirty Jew. I told my dad, and he told me, um, an ignorant bigot. I didn't know what ignorant meant, and I didn't know what bigot meant, but it sounded good. So I did that. Um, it didn't work. Um, so I went back to my dad, uh, I told him it was getting worse, and asked him what I should do. And he looked me in the eye, and he said, uh, at lunchtime, when he's least expecting it, come up behind him and tap him on the shoulder, and when he turns around, punch him in the nose. <laughs> and I remember asking my dad, what do I do then? And he said these exact words, you run like bloody hell. <laughs> um, I remember my heart racing, and my stomach in knots. I could see my brother, Simon, uh, playing soccer in the soccer field where he always was. 
uh, I cautiously approached the boy from behind. He looked really big. <laughs> and I did tap him on the shoulder. And he turned round. And with all my might, I punched him in the nose. And I do recall him looking terribly surprised. And I ran very, very fast to my brother in the soccer field. Um, that bully never, ever came near me again. He didn't tell on me to the teachers either, probably because he didn't want to say that a little girl had punched him in the nose. Um, I'm not sorry I punched the bully. Um, it was actually really quite empowering. Um, and no, I, I, I am not a violent person and I'm not advocating violence. Um, I wish my childhood experience was singular to me, uh, but it's not. Others in the Jewish community uh, have stories of anti-Semitism and also a lack of kindness. Um, but what really saddens me is that each of my children have had their own battles. Uh, and they've given me permission to share some of those. All three of them could take do with some form of abuse. It was a derogatory term that they would hear sometimes daily. It was particularly bad for my son Sam in year 13. He had to call out his classmates for this behaviour. At a Friday night Shabbat dinner, Sam reluctantly told us about an anti-Semitic social media site set up by some of the kids at school that was dedicated to outing Jewish children and teachers at the school. It had vile video clips of Hitler and all from children, probably from very nice homes, uh, was hateful cruel and demeaning. The few who commented adversely were told to get a life or piss off. My son was Nathan was just 14 years old when a hundred graves were desecrated at Macra Cemetery and the Jewish prayer house burnt to the ground. One of the graves desecrated was that of my father, Ron Wolf. Nathan's school wanted to take on the topic of prejudice and anti-Semitism and asked if Nathan would speak at the school assembly. They warned they could not necessarily protect him from boys being boys. Nathan said he would do it anyway. I went to that assembly with a mixture of profound sadness and pride in Nathan. He looked very little on the stage, vulnerable, standing there in front of the whole school. And his opening words were, my name is Nathan Hart and I am Jewish. What child has to stand so tall? It was only a short time later that Jason and other Jewish kids at the school were being routinely verbally abused for being Jewish and Jason had his own way of dealing with it. He liked to hang out with um, the chaplain um, Palmer was very kind and uh, Reverend Palmer called me one day and said, did I know what Jason was doing? <laughs> I said, what's Jason doing? And he said, he's going to enter the speech competition. And I said, that's good, right? And he said, do you know what the speech competition is on? And I said, yes, I think it's on stereotyping. And he said, I think you better talk to Jason. <laughs> um, well, apparently Jason had decided to talk on stereotyping and what it is to be a short Jew. Um, um, I again went to assembly and watched one of my sons speak to the whole school. And Jason delivered a speech that was funny and poignant and sad and exhilarating all at the same time. Uh, he called out the bullies in absolute style. Uh, he won that speech competition. Uh, and the bullying did diminish for him. Um, as a child, I was never given the option of being ashamed of being Jewish uh, or to shy away. I was told to stand up even when it's daunting. And I taught that to my children as well. 
even when it was really, really hard. Um, I do believe that we have rights as New Zealanders and we take those rights um, for, our, for granted, but we have responsibilities as well. And one of those responsibilities is to be upstanders. And I, I really do believe that there is no option, you don't have an option, but to call out anti-Semitism and discrimination wherever you find it. It's not my job just as a Jew to call out anti-Semitism. It's my job as a New Zealander to call out all kinds of discrimination. And really, I do think that the alternative not standing up is utterly untenable because if you don't, uh, the haters will fill the void and New Zealand will turn into a place very fast that we do not want it to be. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, I'm sure I share your sentiments through really very um, fascinating and, and, and different perspectives on this topic. So, so thank you to our panel. I've got some questions I'm going to ask uh, the panel, and this is a good segue given what Deb has just talked about. New Zealand actually has one of the highest levels of bullying in the OECD. But what are some practical and safe ways we can stand up for those being subject to discrimination and or bullying? That is, being upstanders, some safe and practical ways. Andre, can I go to you first, some ideas about how we can actually equip, particularly our kids, to, to be upstanders in Aotearoa today? I think firstly, um, so in regards to kids in the school system, um, them feeling safe that they have networks that they can go and talk to um, when they're being bullied. Um, I think also within the school system, them having their own way of monitoring. But that also brings challenges where, um, if you're going to the monitor, that kind of highlights that, that that bullying's going on for you. But uh, I think that needs to be there as well. But certainly a system where, and how the space is open for kids about being bullied, and then having their peer group being able to stand up for them against those bullies. Sure. Um, I, this is a really interesting topic and, and um, it's an interesting system we have. We're incredibly reactive. Uh, so schools will become reactive if a parent complains, but we need to become proactive, which means we just all need to acknowledge that bullying happens. And it's like sexism, it's the same thing. Sexism happens, bullying happens, racism happens. Uh, where you are going to have gay children amongst um, uh, the students at your school, but we can do something about it. So I think the biggest thing actually is just anticipating that it's there. Uh, and then talking about what it looks like. Uh, because what I've realised is that uh, there's a lot of unconscious bias, a lot of behaviours, uh, and people sometimes don't even know that what they're doing is a form of bullying, is racism, is a whole lot of When you have a proactive uh, environment and you name it and then you show it and then you describe it, uh, then that actually provides the opportunity to have discussions and dialogue. Because it's true, if, if you have a reactive uh, system, people are going to become defensive and I don't want to be called out, but if you make it an environmental issue and a community issue, and how are we all going to work together uh, as parents, as, 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 as young people within schools, how are we going to protect each other, how are we going to uh, support one another? And I remember um, there, there are programs you can have with young people about you know identifying problems and sharing problems, and actually fundamental to that is people's ability to speak and to share. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of the issues that we have in society are because uh, we don't, we, we ra would rather wait and react as opposed to being proactive and then just stopping things from happening in the first place. And that's with a lot of things. We have a, a, a reactive uh, public system. You don't get the support unless you have certain symptoms and then depending on the money you have to have really extreme symptoms to get access. Uh, but uh, I think for our uh, if I were to conceptualise it, and we had um, uh, Professor Patterson and Barbara Disley and Josiah and uh, Mr Langevin, they come and talk to us today about the 
uh, mental health and addiction inquiry that they've just undertaken. And one of the interesting, well, the most interesting thing is we've got to stop medicalizing everything and we've got to create environments where actually we're creating positive mental health and well-being. And the way that you do that uh, is through uh, having programs where we build resilience, but that, uh, I believe it's about relationships and how we talk with one another, uh, whether it's peer-to-peer, -peer, parents to children, parents to parents, adults to adults, students to teachers, teachers to students, which I think is fundamental to breaking down some of those unconscious bias, expectations, racist thoughts, actions, behaviours uh, that we just do automatically because we are generations and generations uh, of colonisation. So it's all premised on a society where uh, one particular view is uh, paramount, uh, that this is the way everything should be, uh, which means it excludes a whole lot of people based on their ethnicity, their culture, their language, uh, their race, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that, that, that's what I think needs to happen. We just need to accept that it happens, be proactive about it, and then do something about it as a collective, because individuals can't sort it out. I think also, um, I, I agree that individuals can't sort it out, in a sense. Um, but in another sense, we can. And I think, you know, we can all do things as individuals to put a protection around those who are being bullied, to stand beside those, those people so that by themselves um, you know, you think about, you know, some of the people who are, who are new to a community, for instance, um, who might not know um, the school culture, if you like, or might not know the neighbourhood. We can, you know, we can be friendly towards them. We can outstretch a hand to them. And we can call out bad behaviour when, when we see it. Um, and we and we should. So that thing of being proactive too, not reactive, not waiting until something happens, um, but giving those people the insulation so that it's less likely to happen. Um, because I think bullies pick on people who they think are marginalised, they think are by themselves, um, they think they don't, they're part of an out group somehow, not an in group. Um, and we as individuals can change that. Um, so I think that is really uh, important. And it's something that we can do in our everyday lives um, very, very easily. It's really an easy thing to do. It's kind of, again, a nice segue to my next question is, um, you know, one of the global challenges that we face is the displacement of, of people, uh, refugees. Uh, it's a huge challenge international community and the whole issue does engender a lot of fear and prejudice amongst um, not you know New Zealanders how do we as a community you know take on our responsibility as being part of the international community and human rights um, provide a, 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 a welcoming um, environment to those who are seeking refuge in uh, Aotearoa Aotearoa this is, uh, and I, can I just, uh, when, I, when I talked about individuals can't do it by themselves, it was more about a cultural practice. Mm. Like if everyone's reaching out, and I mean, I spoke at one of the high schools last year, and I said, you know, a really good way is to have maybe once a, 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 a term, you have a, um, a lunch where somebody needs to sit with somebody that they don't know. Mm. But as a practice, I was speaking to their diversity group. So it's a cultural practice that individuals can do, but it's much easier if it becomes the cultural practice of a school or of a group. So I'm not denying that individuals um, can't through their own action, but I believe that those actions have to be collectivist. Um, so the last couple of years, I've got one of the largest Assyrian uh, communities um, in New Zealand. Um, some of our refugees have come out uh, you know, in the 80s, and for some of those uh, early pioneers, I, I call them, for some of them it took 15 years uh, for family re re reunification to happen. And so one of the things that they asked me to support them 
uh, with was their ability to go to the Minister of Immigration. And so we want to take you know, Syrian refugees uh, broader, I have to say, than their own immediate families, but people uh, who have been through the same experiences with to help them acculturate. So I think it's really, really important that when we uh, are bringing uh, people over through our uh, refugee quota, uh, that they um, also have an ability uh, to be uh, embraced in a situation where language, culture, food, all those things uh, actually have meaning and value to them. Uh, but then I'm also cognizant we have to have uh, a balance because we don't want to just have groups of communities end up being ghettoized, which is so there's a really fine nuanced way uh, of doing all of that because one of the other things I think we should be matching uh, is some sort of analysis about what the skills are and particularly now if we're going to settle people in rural New Zealand we should be settling them in areas that are congruent with their skill base or, or uh, their ability to contribute to get jobs uh, because it's through those networks and alliances through work as we all know, through our associations with different sports and clubs, that you develop relationships uh, that enable you to embed yourself within the fabric of a community. And one of the interesting things that I wanted to share was uh, in Australia, the Canterbury uh, Bulldogs, which is one of the NRL teams, had a specific initiative and they were running it with one of the universities, that all new migrants into that area were given uh, season tickets and bulldogs jerseys and encouraged to go because it provided them with a context where they could be part of something which then enabled them to have a community of interest and by putting on their jersey they then ended up becoming part of a wider community that helped them acculturate and i've kind of seen it through some of our sport if you look at the rugby in Auckland now, and I believe the Blues are going to be a bit of a phenomenon because of the <laughs> uh, like, oh, like, But yeah, it's been the one challenge in some of our sports. How can we use sport as a vehicle to actually provide those contexts and opportunities for relationships to develop cross-culturally? And, and I do believe sport is one of those areas within our society that can help. Um, I like, And I fundamentally believe some of the other things that are starting to happen uh, in different communities where the mana whenua uh, provide poverty, you know, there is that opportunity uh, for uh, a real and meaningful uh, kind of acknowledgement that people, like through the citizenship ceremonies and things like that, which I've certainly seen in South Auckland, and I know that some of our refugee migrant communities actually have grasped that. And because they grasp the language and culture, our Māori communities are reaching out, and it's through those genuine, authentic engagements and relationships that I believe we can, we can more meaningfully uh, assist people uh, to find some happiness. Because I think the other thing that we all forget is a lot of refugees who come, uh, have come and their life journeys are horrific. And we have a big responsibility, I think, to help uh, support them to fulfill their potential as, as citizens of our country. You know, as I'll just add on to um, three of the things that you talked about. One being sport. Um, so I'll, I'll just slightly go global. Um, one of the things that UNICEF does is utilise sport as a connector for young people. Uh, and in New Zealand, uh, we had a program running with um, New Zealand Football Association called um, Just Play. and um, um, was, football was a way to connect um, migrant communities because football, soccer, as we call it, is popular all around the world, much to um, uh, um, history in Whakapapa. Uh, but um, football being used for migrant children uh, to bring them into the communities and connect more of their communities. And I actually saw this when I, I had the um, opportunity to go to to Lebanon about three years ago and saw a football program being used to bring together um, the Lebanese youth, um, Syrian youth and Palestinian youth who were in their adult communities. There was a lot of tension, but sport was being used to bring bring those, um, uh, in terms of the migrant um, children, um, integrate them with the other, other kids and um, see sport as a big connector. The other thing being, um, you mentioned um, connecting to 
on a whenua and that kind of thing. I think there's a lot in Maori culture in terms of the process of whakawhanaunga which is getting to you know, getting to make 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 people like family. I think if more of that occurs and is in place for migrants when they come to New Zealand, that's a way um, to not only make them feel welcome but for um, the people here to understand them better as well. And then in terms of the places where migrants refugees are likely to go when they come to the country. So that is places like hospitals, schools, social services, that there's direct, um, for lack of a better word, diversity training program systems to help them work with those people when they arrive in the country. Yeah. Um, the, the thing I think about a lot when I think about refugees coming here is, is what is coming down the line. Um, you know, the we have climate change, we, we know we have climate change on our doorstep. We have countries that in our lifetime will be no more, countries like Kiribati. Uh, we, um, we live in a world where the have-nots can see what the haves have and want it. Why shouldn't they? Um, and we're going to see very big movements of populations um, in the world. Uh, and we have so much in this in this country, um, and I actually believe that we could take more refugees, and uh, I think refugees make great citizens. Um, nobody has more of a um, desire to make things work than when you've come from some of the most horrendous um, circumstances. Um, and we know from what we've experienced in the past that refugees um, can be really enriching for us as well. It's not, um, it's not take, um, really. We will be doing it for, for our own good. Um, so I think the approach that we take refugees and we set up the services that are needed and wrap services around them is absolutely right. Um, but I think we should be doing a lot more of that. And I think um, we do have a global responsibility to uh, look after people who are refugees. And I'd like to, to see us doing um, a, a bit more of it. Um, and the other thing to say is that the issue of refugees needs a global response. Um, and um, that's way above my pay scale. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But that's what it does need, not just, you know, one country saying, oh, look, okay, we'll take, you know, this many in another country, but really a, a global response because it's not going away. Okay, my last question for Pamela, we'll open up to the floor, is the um, interesting one of um, gender discrimination still remains a significant issue, particularly around gender pay gap. Um, and I know that New Zealand, um, comparatively speaking, is probably in the higher quartile in terms of the gender pay gap, but it remains a real issue. Um, so what are some credible legislative and wider community options? And I just mentioned what Iceland has done. I appreciate it has a very small population, but I think um, they've now mandated um, equal pay and businesses above um, a certain um, revenue uh, scale have to uh, report to the government uh, and they audited to ensure that it's equal pay. So they've actually said, we're not going to take an incremental approach. We're actually going to, as a government, as a country, say equal pay is um, going to happen and we're going to enforce that. So just kind of really interested in, in um, what the panel thinks about that issue. And I'll come back to you, Deborah, and we'll work our way down again. Um, so we've had equal pay legislation in this country since, I think, 1972. Um, and you'd have to say it hasn't worked because there's a gender pay gap. Um, and the gender pay gap is, is really pretty awful for women. It's worse for Maori women uh, and it's worse still for Pacifica women. And worse uh, still for migrant women. There we go, I'm sure that's right. 29%. So I mean, you think about you think about that 29%. I, I suppose 29% means that somewhere a bit around August, you start working for free for the rest of the year. That, that's what that actually means. Um, and I think you know, continuing to do the same thing, um, which you know isn't working, is the 
definition of stupidity. Um, and I'm not a great one for um, legislation of these kinds of things, but I think that's exactly what we have to do. I think we have to um, hold employers to account. I think um, people have to know what the, the going rate um, is um, for people working across that sector and that kind of role, particularly as we're a country of small business, uh, small businesses, something like 87% of all our businesses are small businesses. So there might only be one person in the role that you are undertaking in that business. How on earth are you to know if you're being paid fairly um, as a woman um, in that, that business? Uh, and I think we're going to have to have quotas on boards as well um, because there is an appalling lack of women on on boards and it's not because there is an appalling lack of able women. Uh, so I actually... Well, one thing the Scandinavians have done, I think Norway is... Absolutely, um, and, and the um, yeah, Iceland. Um, so I think we just have to really... Um, it's, um, it, it, it's now the time, I think, that we can say that we've failed. We've absolutely failed. Um, and we shouldn't be failing um, our, our children, um, and particularly our girls. <laughs> you should be fairly remunerated when you go out into the workplace, and we should be making sure um, happens for you and what we've done just hasn't worked. You know, I think um, any initiative that um, and options that lead to um, small women and gender pay gap um, uh, issues that we're talking about around this issue and go back to how that exists through um, men's um, men um, and their sense of power and superiority and, and allowing those conditions to exist and, and allowing um, the thought and coil that um, women deserve less pay than them or that, that it's okay. And I think that discussion, discussion, those kinds of discussions need to go back to model that um, fathers talk to their sons about in terms of um, equality uh, for the females that are in their family. I think that's the kind of cordial that needs to go to the changing rooms and um, men's sports clubs and right up to the board level to um, talk about and expose um, that it does exist and that um, uh, the whole culture of men's superiority to make that, um, make that the um, uh, the gender gap, gender gap issue talked about in a wider, wider sense. So I uh, want to pick up on the um, concept that Andres just talked about in terms of the equality of the outcome. Because we talk a lot in society about the equality of opportunity, but the reality is uh, things don't just happen. Uh, things happen because people make them happen. And so I've become uh, really supportive of uh, legislation that uh, will compel 100 companies to have uh, women on their boards. Uh, we know from recent publications that um, Judy McGregor has put out, she used to be the previous or our previous EEO commissioner, there's about 22 boards in New Zealand that don't have any women on them. So in the, uh, you know, in the, in the, public sector, the government has an aspiration of 50-50 women uh, and men on boards um, and I believe that it is time to look at I believe that it's time to institute transparency in terms of uh, what uh, companies are paying uh, men and women uh, I do believe that uh, instituting things like a living wage actually is lifting our most vulnerable workers, which in most instances are our most vulnerable women, and they're our, our mamas and our
do the cleaning. You know, they're the ones who uh, actually slog so much for uh, their families and are the least valued in our society. The people who are working in our rest homes, those types of vocations where women have traditionally chosen because uh, we do care. And I'm not saying that men don't, but I believe women naturally uh, gravitate um, to these uh, particular vocations. So uh, for me, it, it continues to symbolise um, the sexism that exists in our society and a society premised on you know, men being uh, the superior and women being subordinate. So if we really do believe in equality and equality, then we have to do something about the systems that continue to perpetuate these outcomes, which is just like racism. We have to do deliberate things uh, to highlight and address. And so, you know, there isn't an appetite, can I say, uh, in the Parliament at the moment for a bill about um, quotas. In the last Parliament, my colleague Jane Logie had a bill that was picked over the ballot uh, in terms of transparency of that reporting, and it got voted down. So, you know, part of the work that we need to do in there, we need the people out here pushing it. And we do have the Human Rights Commission and our new EEO Commissioner. I know the transparency and the quotas are on her agenda, but we also need groups, and that's when the collective activism works. And we're really cool if some young women's groups <laughs> start <laughs> championing this issue so that when you graduate from university, you want to be paid like anybody else. You want to be uh, equal citizens and you don't want any gender pay gap. That gets some traction. And that's when we need our young women's voices because you are helping us uh, to address these issues. But it's about legacy. We need to change the future uh, for those that are going to come after us. So I'll put that challenge out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to actually put it back to you and, and, and give you the opportunity to um, ask questions. Uh, Chris has got microphones, so um, is there anyone that would like to ask the panel a question? I got a question. Um, mental health issue as a consequence of discrimination. Mm -hmm. For example, in childhood development or bullying at school, bullying at work. Mm -hmm. So how is the society going to do to help this victim? So, um, I'd like to... Uh, okay. uh, that, that's a really, really good uh, Question, and particularly within the context of the mental health inquiry that has just happened because one of the issues that they highlighted was childhood trauma and the impact of childhood trauma and one of the most graphic examples not related to but has been to the children uh, who have uh, endured like the crisis and so there's been a very specific response uh, to that um, from uh, the government cross party, it's a $27 million investment to making sure that we're supporting children through trauma. Uh, I believe what's going, what is happening at the Canterbury District Health Board is going to provide, um, I believe, a formula for building resilience in our kids that will extend beyond the Canterbury earthquake and that's what they talked about today actually in the Select Committee. But you're right, when you grow up um, being bullied, victimised, you grow up with anxiety issues. And so children have panic attacks and they have re-triggerings and um, it's very difficult for them to trust in their relationships. Um, I think we've just not ever addressed uh, discrimination and racism as a trauma that then impacts on the rest of your life. But I know that there are some people like Kim Workman who works in the criminal justice system and works with uh, people who have ended up with, in prison, that if you look at their life stories, I believe a lot of it, and, and particularly we have a disproportionate number of in prison, and we're just starting to talk about the impacts from an academic perspective of colonisation, for example, and how that trauma has been passed down from generation to generation. Now, what that actually looks like is how do people, people cope? They cope with drugs, 
alcohol uh, they have stress in their lives they don't have the tools to be able to address those uh, we also have a lot of unmet need with maybe health needs uh, so we have you know four uh, educational uh, outcomes and we all know that it's through education uh, that you can get access to really good quality jobs so we do have a lot of issues um, but what you're just talking about I think is an un undiagnosed now if there's a clinician in the house and there's a, a diagnosis for children who have experienced uh, you know continual uh, bullying and harassment but with the, because of racism maybe you know but I don't know but I absolutely think that it exists but that's why we need to um, stamp out bullying and anticipate it and do it and try and break down all those barriers which is why I really support um, the human rights diversity and inclusion policies and days and sharing of culture and food and all the symbolism now around Chinese New Year, you know, Matariki, uh, the, um, what's it called, uh, the uh, Indian New Year when they come around. Uh, yeah, so everything, like all of that, which has become, I think, part of the fabric of, of the big cities. We sell. Yeah. 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 Anxiety that leads to mental health for, um, for young people and the conditions that create that anxiety. Um, if we, uh, and, and then look at the role that poverty plays in that in terms of not enough money in the household. Um, you know, and you, you break that down to the stress that occurs in the household because of the lack of money, um, the impact that has on kids and um, how they go to school, impacting on their education, which has the um, a snowballing generational effect. Um, and, you know, and one of the worst outcomes for that is that um, for New Zealand we have the highest rate of youth, teenage, teenage suicide in the world. And I, um, I believe poverty plays a key role in causing that anxiety that um, creates a trigger of a number of things for people, for young people in their homes. And one impact of that is um, poor mental health and well-being. So, um, yeah, having an impact on improving and better outcomes in terms of um, education, income, and um, limiting poverty, I think, has a huge impact. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, kia ora. Um, I'm just shifted up to Wellington after uh, spending the last four years living with and working with people from mostly Pākehā rural communities. Um, how would you recommend engaging um, with the likes of these communities when a lot of the time is Wonderful as these discussions are, they're completely foreign. That's that's right, isn't it? There's, I mean, there's. I think we sit here in Wellington, and we, you know, <laughs> if anywhere in the country, uh, we having these kind. Of, uh, Wellington is, you know, politicised. It's education. Um, it's you know joy, you know, thinking about these kinds of things, and um, and but it's not so everywhere in in New Zealand. And I think it's a it's a great question that you ask about well, how do we make the change? Basically, not just here, but but everywhere. Um, I think part of the answer is that we are a a small country um, and I think that's that's of, of a benefit because it's very difficult um, to remain in your own little silo um, for too long and I'll, I'll tell you a story that happened to me just just this um, this last Christmas when I was at a friend's place um, for um, a, you know, a pre-Christmas kind of drinks function, um, and she lives out in the country. Um, and I got talking to the farmer who lives um, next door, and he, and we were just, you know, chilling away, and um, and we started talking politics, and he said, um, oh, I think the Luftwaffe had it right, and, <laughs> which is completely out of left field. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, oh, um, 
They knew how to, you know, they knew how to, you know, do things and get things done. Um, and I said, yes, they, they really did. They supported a system that, you know, murdered six million people. Uh, and he, he said, and he said, um, yeah, but we don't know the six million people. Um, and I said, actually, we do. Um, <laughs> actually, we do. Um, and he said, no, we don't. Uh, and I said, look, you know, even you know the German government would agree that we do, um, and it underlined the whole discussion. Underlined for me that you know there I was, you know, <laughs> sitting in my own little world, not expecting um, to have that kind of discussion. And neither was he. <laughs> he wasn't expecting to be confronted on on this. He. And these were just views that he, he held and he probably never talked them out and we talked them out. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, part of the answer is that we are becoming much more connected. Um, the the um, internet, you know, goes into, you know, most rural communities now. It's certainly not the whole answer because people end up talking to themselves sometimes or often on the internet and find they agree with and then that just you know re-establishes their their belief. Um, but I think New Zealand is not the um, the society it was even 20 years ago. Um, and there's no hiding from that. Um, and if I think about gay rights, um, I remember my lifetime um, homosexual law reform um, and um, as a student marching for homosexual law reform for the decriminalisation of homosexuality in my lifetime. Um, we've come a long way and there's no hiding from that wherever you are in New Zealand and that's a very, very good thing. If, I, if I'm understanding your question correctly about reaching out to um, outside of Wellington to the more regional areas and getting the message through, well, one of the things I'm seeing in the work that I do at UNICEF is that um, we talk in a language that no one understands and, um, and perhaps we need to look at the way we're framing the type of, you know, bring it into meaningful language that people will sit down at the kitchen table to talk about the issue. Talk about it in terms of, of course, depends on your audience. Things like policy and legislation and regulations. Um, what does that mean to someone living in Pukekohe at the kitchen table and having a cup of tea and eating, um, having dinner? I think so. One thing is how we frame and the type of language that we use. People like us who know. Uh, I'm just trying to find. Um, something concrete to contribute and uh, actually one of the interesting thing that happens um, because I'm part of this cross-party women's group is we get women, national women's organisations come in and talk to us and so last year we had rural women come in as an advocate and one of the issues that they have uh, suddenly realised is happening uh, because we have a lot of migrant farm workers is that many of them are coming to New Zealand uh, with wives and children, but the wives are being isolated. Men go out uh, and work all day, the women are home, the kids go to school, but there are real concerns about the health needs of women in these rural in these rural communities. Uh, services so that their health needs being met. relationships that they're having with others which if they're isolated too much. So all I can say is in spaces like that, I mean we rely on advocacy and also the prioritisation of groups like rural women who bring these issues to us, but they do want a policy response. They want to know about how we can get doctors or nurse practitioners into those communities to, to do the assessments to make sure that those women and their health and wellbeing needs are being met. So it is on the agenda um, and, it, and, it, and it becomes an agenda. 
you know, through people actually caring and anticipating that these things are happening because we know that there are a lot of migrant communities and what are we actually doing to make sure. And, and I also think it fits in, uh, in some of the work safe uh, kind of context around health and safety and, um, you know, we have had a lot of suicides in, in the farming sector and, and so broadening those conversations because a lot of it fundamentally uh, is about relationships and uh, people who have an oversight and kind of trying to find ways to connect. Yeah, so I hope that made sense for you. <laughs> uh, we've got time for one more question. Maybe two, all right, two, okay. <laughs> Sharing your thoughts today. A lot of good food for thought out there. Um, my question is surrounding cultural norms um, that pose when you are opening a dialogue. And so it's almost an extension of the last question that we had. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of the issues surrounding cultural norms where it is not a thing um, to actually air out your dirty laundry and often it's confined within family units, so um, there might not be that same sense of community that's there with other cultures. I mean, the interesting one of that is, you know, treatment of sort of LGBT people with um, different communities, how, you know, how that issue is, is, is kind of addressed by um, family and wider communities within New Zealand. So I'm going to ask you. I saw. Let me speak from a Pacifica perspective. So, thing you know, the issue of um, LGBTQI um, kids, people growing up in a Pacifica community, can be very hard, to, to, very difficult to discuss and confront um, in your family, where um, uh, the norm is to not do that and to almost not um, not acknowledge it. Um, but what I am seeing more of now is. Um, young people having the courage to be able to do that, but to do it um, honestly, respectfully, and, um, and and being able to talk to um, the elders in their community about an issue like LGBTQI um, that may exist. So um, I agree that, it, yeah, yeah, it is difficult where that is the norm. Um, and seeing it being um, coming out a lot more, and um, people having the courage to be able to do that uh, but um, be honestly, gently, and um, with respect. Um, I I work in the area of dispute resolution, um, and many mediators will tell you um, that for many cultures, um, to be in dispute is to lose face. It's 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 um, you know it's not something that you know you feel that you can. You know, go into the court system because to, to do that is to to lose face. And I and I and I see them and the work that they do in forming um, structures that enable people resolve what is a dispute in a way that is culturally appropriate to them. And I think we have to be um, a lot more thoughtful and kind about what people need um, and how they need to uh, resolve um, resolve various issues um, that they may have, um, but also being you know really thoughtful and, and, and kind uh, to them in our community so that they can be exactly who they are. Um, so I hope that's help anyway. Uh, in, in the LGBT space, um, I do a lot of work with a group called Shakti, and they're based up in, uh, uh, well, they've got bases in Auckland, uh, down here in Wellington. They focus a lot on family violence in Tauranga and Christchurch. Uh, but I work with this amazing young woman called Wing Ju, uh, who talks to me a lot about, um, I guess, the courage and strength of this younger generation of uh, call them migrant, uh, uh, young countries where being LGBTI actually is still a criminal offence. I mean, people need to know in 72 countries in the world, including Samoa and Tonga, uh, if you are LGBT, you're a criminal. And in 13 countries in the world, if you're LGBTI, 
uh, they kill you. Um, I'm talking literally kill you, uh, or you're incarcerated for many, many years, tortured, uh, etc. So for some of those uh, cultures, you can't even have a conversation. It's true. You can't even find leaders in that community who are willing to have conversations. Uh, so from, you know, from my perspective, I want to support and help young people who, when they do, some of them get kicked out of home. They've got nowhere to go. They've got, you know, no networks, no support. So, you know, organisations like Shakti, their advocacy to politicians like me is we need a refuge for young, you know, migrant refugee uh, LGBT because they've got no one else. Um, so it's difficult because we just have to continually find the leaders and those within communities that are, I guess, wanting to provide for their, their children as best they can. And I guess in a society like ours, that's become really permissive and accepting and supportive of LGBT. Uh, of course, we're going to have those types of challenges. So that's, I'd call that a contemporary challenge right now. Um, but the other issue I just wanted to highlight is, so through the Human Rights Commission and our Cross-Party Women's Group, we've been working on the issue of female genital mutilation. Now, people won't know it's, it happens in New Zealand. It's happening. You know, we've had communities where this is a cultural practice, and it's been really interesting over the last few years working with women within uh, the Somalian community or other communities where we've got quite a, um, you know, a diaspora of those communities who are now New Zealand citizens here, fearing for the next generation because those cultural practices, because they're linked to marriage and family and honour and a whole lot of other things, are still wanting to practice those types of uh, cultural practices here in New Zealand. And one of the challenges we've had is how do we have that discussion? How do they have the discussion? Um, and we've had to sit alongside and support. Uh, and to be honest, it's become now an issue for our cross-party women's group because we want to update uh, the definitions around female genital mutilation to include um, ceremonial piercings, which have become acceptable because they're not the removal of anything. Uh, but the young women that we have engaged with who have engaged with different generations of women who have come out have actually said no because that condones the practice. And that practice fundamentally uh, is about subjugating women and saying that women uh, are the cattle or the, are owned by their husbands. So they've now come to a, a, a place where they want to update New Zealand's definition to exclude that, that particular practice, which some people thought was a good compromise. But they've said, no, we need to just end it, you know, categorically. And so we're working through a process at the moment with the community, with the Human Rights Commission, to draft a bill to update our legislation that says fundamentally it's wrong and we do not condone it. But that's been a three-year process to get there. But we've had the um, courage within the community to have the conversations, to bring it to the Human Rights Commission, to bring it to us. And now that we're all in a position where we're all working together. But very sensitive issues. And actually it's built on trust, relationships, um, talking through all the possible solutions and then us now supporting what they want to do. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. And there was one, um, yes, Chris Hello, um, I'm Jess. Um, I just had a uh, question. Um, so what would you say, I guess, or do for youth who sort of believe that they feel, they feel quite disillusioned from being able to make a change? And I guess in a way that sort of affects their ability to stand up, like what would you do to counter that problem? Because I feel like a lot of young people might not necessarily have that sort of courage or like they don't feel like the individual voice actually more would you, I guess, to come to that? Yeah. The, um, do just one song, so just do one, be a big 
and and it, it doesn't have to be reactive. It can be that when you go to school and you see someone that with somebody else and they seem to not have too many friends to go and talk to them. It's really as simple as that. When when I think of my childhood and my my childhood friends who are non-Jewish and just treated me like I was normal, <laughs> and I was, <laughs> um, I mean, that was the most fantastic thing in the whole wide world. I didn't think about it at the time. But, I mean, they were my, they were my support system, actually. They were the thing that, they were the thing that insulated me from this, when it wasn't so good. And you can do that. It's a really, really easy, it's a really easy thing to do. And the other thing that I'd say to you is that if you do see um, prejudice and discrimination, um, take a deep breath and and do something about it, you will feel better afterwards that you did that, whether it's, you know, going and talking to a teacher or, you know, talking to your parents or, but don't leave it. If you feel you can take it on, do, um, and, you know, do, um, but don't just, don't leave it. Um, and, so, and sometimes it doesn't feel it doesn't feel safe, it doesn't feel, you know, it feels like a hard thing to do, it does, so, I mean, most of us feel like that, um, but that's the job. I'll just keep it quick and simple, um, I think there's power in the collective and connecting with, um, the first thing I need to identify other people in your youth community that feel the same way as you. That you can collectively um, take your voices um, to be heard, and, and I think also firstly realise that you you have a voice and you have the right to be heard, and people will listen. <laughs> so, from a proactive perspective and a celebratory perspective, uh, the eighth of March does the eighth of March mean anything to you? Oh, it's International Women's Day. Yeah. So you could do something on International Women's Day. Is the 17th of May mean anything to you? 17th of May is Ida Hobbit Day, which is the international day uh, to celebrate uh, LGBT, so LGBT rights. And then we've got the 10th of December, which is Human Rights Day. The reason I've highlighted those is that there are days in the international calendar, so rather than be reactive, you can be proactive in your schools where you're celebrating things, celebrating diversity, celebrating women, celebrating Indigenous people. But you can, and you should not do these things alone, but you can work with groups of people to celebrate. The other way you get mobilised is actually you do react to something that's happened and you stand up, whether it's for uh, gender-free bathrooms or whether it's for uniforms that mean you can wear pants or whatever, whatever it is. But it should be genuine and authentic things that really motivate you. Like the, One of the things I've become most passionate about uh, in the last year is um, is the Smear Your Mirror campaign, which is a Māori specific campaign that was uh, designed by a woman who in her last four months of life uh, said to every Māori woman at Matata Matatini this year, I challenge all of you to have a smear. And she did that because uh, she had a really bad experience and she just said, I'm never going back. You know, call it a racist, you know, culturally incompetent system. But the outcome for her was a diagnosis of stage four cervical cancer, and she died. And so her big thing before she died was to challenge all the women. And I think I was talking because um, there's a group that have ridden, ridden bikes from North Rotorua down here. They were up this morning. It's going to be able to come out. There's 46 of them. 100% smear me out. Plus, what they've also done is encouraged all their men, and we're talking about, to go and have prostate cancer checks and health checks, and they're going to have this near and near at Timotini. So they've got the data of it. So, I mean, it's things like that that you become passionate about. Now, why did I? Because I heard Talu speak at a forum, you know, and she was the most amazing speaker. And then she go, and then it was like, um, you know, I'm going to live, I've had my treatment. And then two weeks later, it was, I'm going to die. You know, I've got terminal... 
uh, cancer, but what am I going to choose to do with the last four months of my life? I'm going to be a champion and campaign so this doesn't happen to another woman who doesn't, for whatever reason, is going to do this because she's doing this for herself, for her children. She never even, she didn't need to be a screenshot. You know, it's really sad. But that's what kind of motivates you. So whenever you get captivated by, you'll find others who, just like you are as passionate. And can I say, I talk that to our cross party women's group, and we ask everyone in our parliament uh, whether they have been, whether they were up to date, for so legit sneeze and immigrants. Now, for you, it might be HB and vaccine. And I'm just saying that because I'm, because actually, if you look at the prevention of cervical cancer, we now know that the HPV vaccine is really effective because the Australian data uh, is saying that we will end cervical cancer. So anyway, that's my little spiel. Just find something that you're passionate about and, and lead it. And you know what? A whole lot of other people will join you because they'll be as passionate as you are. Okay. Thank you. Can you can I ask the audience to uh, just acknowledge our panel? I think it's been a fantastic discussion. Thank you very, very much for your, your, your time and, and your contribution. I found it personally very stimulating and interesting. I think the message is uh, we can be outstanders. Um, that's, that's the option that we have. So just a couple of things. Our next forum is on disability rights. We're going to take a historic look at the treatment of um, disability from the Holocaust to modern day. We have a, a, a really great panel. Um, can I ask you, on your way out, if you haven't, I've just left us to contact each other so we can keep you updated on information. There's a sheet just on the table um, before you go out. Um, all travel safely. Thank you for coming um, this evening. Thank you. Thank you.